the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Today is the anniversary of the great Chicago fire. The one that was started by Mrs. O'Leary's cow. Yes, yeah, Mrs. O'Leary's cow. See, everybody knows her name, but who knows the cow's name? That should be a famous name, too. Maybe Tony knows. Oh, I'm sorry, fellas, but that's one famous name I don't know. But I do know that Anchor Hawking is the most famous name in glass. (laughs) Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, Wedding Breakfast. Five o'clock in the morning. A dull and dreary five o'clock. In the big morning express building, an elevator halts at the floor of the photography department, and... Get out here with me, Annie. Oh, I've got a report up the city room, Casey. Oh, if you do, the boss is liable to stock you with another assignment before you've got time to recover from the one we just had. Come on, Annie. Okay. <sighs> I need a breather. Yeah, me too. I'll hand in the pictures I got for developing. We'll hop out and grab a cup of coffee. Two or three cups. Strong. Yeah, let me get that door for you. Oh, thanks. Hi, right, Casey. Hi. Right. Morning, Williams. Oh, there's been nothing good about this morning, Pollock. You two look kind of beat up. Well, if you'd seen four dead bodies spread over the pavement in action like we've just seen, you'd look beat up, too. I hear the films I exposed, Pollock. They're not pretty. Run them through the developer, will you? Okay. My desk phone. Probably the guy who's been trying to get you ever since you went on that accident what, thing. What, somebody's been calling me? He gave his name as Jimmy Hackett. Wouldn't say what he wanted you for. I don't know any Jimmy Hackett. Hello, Casey speaking. Oh, finally I get you. This is Jimmy the Hackett, Casey. Jimmy who? The Hackett. You know, the cab driver you got out of a jam when them cops... Oh, were... Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, Casey. When a guy does me a favor, I ain't happy till I can do something for him. Now I got what I think is an exclusive story for you. Okay, shoot it, pal. You know Sylvia Loomis, the multi-million heiress? Well, I know of her. Yeah. You know anything about a party named Duke Pavel? He's got fancy Marshall hair, and he don't talk good American like you and me. Baron Rennie Dupavu? Yeah, that's the guy. Oh, well, what about well, him? He and this Loomis chicken got married tonight. What? This is straight good, Casey. Hey, listen to this, Annie, would you? Go ahead, Jimmy, go oh, ahead. Uh, about 3 this a.m., I pick up three couples outside the club Taz Bar. Yeah? They, they told me to drive to Fieldson just over the state line. They get a justice and a piece out of bed, and one of the couples gets married. What do you know? Well, from talk I heard, it seems they get a license last week sometime. But the girl had started to welch on the ball and chain idea. That this, uh, that Duke Pavel and his friends better quite a few drinks at the cash bar tonight and talked her into going through with it. Well, it was only during the drive back to the guy's apartment that I get wise to who the newly went to us. Sylvia Loomis and Baron ready to Pavel. Huh? That's right. I took them and their friends to Duke Pavel's apartment, the Wilshire Manor. They, they plan to have more drinks there and a wedding breakfast. This hot nose for your case. It's plenty hot, Jimmy, and thanks a million. Uh, don't thank me. I'm still thanking you for getting me out of that jam. Uh, Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Jim. You heard that, Annie? Oh, this is front page stuff, Casey. Sylvia Loomis is one of the richest gals in the world. And the guy Jimmy says she's married is an A1 rat, Annie. Mm. The Pavel's never done a decent day's work in his life. Uh, but what a handsome hunk of man he is. Huh? Oh. Say, that Loomis girl. It was in case of Artie Mason. I wonder what... Hmm. Hey, well, come on. That wedding breakfast ought to be starting about now. Let's get up to city desk, lay our tip on the line, then go to the Pavel's apartment for confirmation. Okay, huh? a simple social assignment like this will be a welcome relief, Casey, after that accident job we just finished. Ooh, we got a lucky break, Casey. Yeah. If that elevator man hadn't been enjoying a nap... We'd never have gotten up here to do Pavel's apartment unannounced. Not in a swanky joint like this. Oh, did you press the third floor button? Yeah. Here we are. Uh, according to the directory downstairs, his apartment is 3D. Oh, here's 3A. D ought to be that door at the end of this hall here. Yeah. 
Hey, look. A woman's coming out of there. Oh, she's in a big hurry. Too. She's running down the stairs. Yeah. I thought something was after her. Huh. I think she's going away so fast because she just had an unpleasant surprise, Annie. What do you mean? I recognize that day, man. That's Mrs. Fred Gardner. The Mrs. Fred Gardner? Mm-hmm, the. According to gossip, she's been one of DePavel's gal friends. It must have shocked her to meet his brand new bride. Oh, the meeting must have been a shock to everyone concerned. I don't hear any sound in there of what is laughingly called merriment. Now, wait, I'll ring the bell. The door's partly open, Casey. Yeah. There's not a sound from inside. Well, no one answers your ring. Let's have a look inside, huh? The living room's empty. Boy, there's been a party in there. Eyeball glasses all around. Maybe everybody went out for that wedding. Annie, come in. Let me close this door. Have a look around. Hey, Casey, we have no right we'll to... We'll take the right. Mrs. Gardner had a reason to run out of here the way she did, Annie. Hey. Look, look at this. What? Pieces of the marriage certificate. That's what it looks like. Well, somebody tore it to bits. Stick again in that next room. Looks like a library. <gasps> He's Holy smokes. That man on the floor. That's Dupavio. His skull's been crushed in there. He's dead. The body's still warm. Hey, the woman we saw leave here, Mrs. Gardner, she's the Shh, one. quiet. Huh? Listen. Someone's in this room. Here the guy is, on the floor behind the sofa. Hey, it's Artie Mason. He's asleep. Probably drunk. That statuette beside his hand. There's blood on it, Casey. Fresh blood, Annie. This bronze statuette is what killed Dupavio. Then Mason must have done it. He was crazy about Sylvia Loomis. He found out she'd married this gigolo. He came up uh, here Don't go too and... fast, Annie. Don't forget Mrs. Gardner. Don't forget the bride. Sylvia, yeah. Hey, come on back to the library. There must be a phone in there, and I'll call City Day. Hey, give the cops a ring afterward. They may be interested. Well, just as soon as I get my story in. Oh, there's the phone. Uh-oh. You won't call on that. Oh, the wire's been yanked Find out. a telephone outside, Annie. All oh, right. You? I'll take the car and find a phone and come back here with a cop. Right. While you're doing that, I'll make with a camera here. Okay, I'm on my way. All right, I'll lock the door behind you. Nobody else can walk in like we did. Well, I'll come back as soon as I can and, and ring the bell. All right, so long. <clears throat> what a beautiful front page picture this is going to make. Ah, another shot of the dead man from another angle. He made a quick trip. Just a second, Annie. I'll let you in. What? Who are you? Who are you? Larkin's the name. I want to see De Pavel. He isn't here. He'd better be here, and he'd better see me. Out of my way, Wait fella. a minute. I, I said out of my I don't way. I like being pushed around like that, mister. That's too bad. Tough, huh? Plenty. Now, go tell De Pavel I'm here for the stuff he promised. What stuff? He knows. Just tell him Horseshoe Larkin's here. Oh, I've heard of you. You're one of the gambling racket guys I never ran into before. On your way. Get to Pavel. I'll take you to the Pavel. Step into the library here. Okay. There he is. What? I'm afraid he isn't going to give you the stuff he promised. When did this happen? Not very long ago. Did you? No. I didn't kill him. Maybe the guy over here did. Artie Mason. You know Mason? Yeah. He's drunk. Passed out. It kind of looks that way. How do you fit into this? I just happen to be waiting for a bus that runs right through here. Cut the comedy. You a cop? Yes. I get you now. That camera, you're a press photographer. You got me, yeah. Casey's the name. Uh, that uh, picture's hanging crooked on the wall. Don't touch that. Don't touch anything before the cops get here. How long you been alone here? Ten, fifteen minutes. Why did you want to straighten that picture? Habit. I can't stand seeing things crooked. <laughs> That's coming from you as the makings of a joke. Yeah. You think Artie Mason bumped off to Pebble? I'm keeping an open mind. You sent for the cops, of course. Yeah. I'll wait for them. I'm interested in what they'll have to say. Yeah, and they'll be interested in what you'll have to say. Mister, I've got an alibi. Shh, quiet. Huh? I heard something like a door. Somebody else in the joint? The kitchen. I'm going out and I'm see. I'm coming with you. Who are you and what are you doing here? I beg your pardon. You heard me. Oh, I know this guy, Casey. His name's Waldo. He's DePavel's servant. I'm Baron DePavel's man, Mr. Huh. Larkin. 
How did you get in here? When? I left myself in the service door there just a few moments Reporting ago. Reporting for work? Yes, sir. And this kind of early? Well, the Baron telephoned me about an hour ago and said he wished me to prepare a special breakfast. Oh, yeah, that checks. If you permit me, sir, who are you and why do you question me? Step into the library and I'll show you well, why. Well, just a moment while I replace this dish of dog food in the refrigerator. I'd just taken it out with you. Dog food? For the Baron's spaniel. I haven't seen any spaniel. Oh, he's there in the butler's pantry, sir. Oh, yeah, I see. He's the world's lousiest watchdog. Hadn't been a yap out of him. He's very old and sick. Yeah, he looks it. Come on in the library. Don't touch anything. Don't touch That's anything. That's the reason why. The Baron, he... Oh, what has happened? Kind of plain, isn't it, Waldo? Is... Is he dead? Completely. There's the guy behind the couch. You finished him off. Mr. Mason. You know him, huh? He came here last week... And he threatened the Baron. Threatened him? Yes, sir. I heard him say that if, if Baron de Paville didn't keep away from Miss Loomis, he, he, he'd kill him. That does it, Casey. Mason's the killer. Doesn't sound too good for the guy, Larkin, but I'm still keeping an open mind. Answer that doorbell, will you, Waldo? Yes, sir. I think a lady rang it with some cops. <laughs> Our story will continue in just a moment. In honor of our great American wine industry, next week has been designated as National Wine Week. We have a right to be proud of American wines, and we're glad to acknowledge a debt of gratitude to those who have accomplished so much for us in vineyard and winery. They've made it possible for us to enjoy wines of exquisite taste and superb character. These wines appear on our table bearing the legend, grown and bottled in America for the world to respect and enjoy. Make it a point to serve delicious wines with your meals. And what a choice you have in American wines. Wines that bring you the taste and bouquet of the living grape. Wines that delight the eye with gem-like colors that range from the pale glitter of the topaz to the deep glow of the ruby. All of them good, all of them delicious, all of them American. American wines come to you in clean glass bottles. For glass bottles only can bring you wine as it comes from the winery, unaffected by any foreign taste or flavor. Now, quite naturally, the American wine industry comes to Anchor Glass for carefully made wine bottles. Another product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Captain Logan, how long will it take to sober Mason up? Well, the doc says it'll be hours before he can tell a coherent story, Miss Williams. The guy really had a skin full, Logan. I'll say. Well, he probably didn't know what he was doing when he killed you, Peville. He knew what he was doing a week ago when he threatened to kill him. I want to know just how Mrs. Gardner fits into this picture. What made the bride do a fade out? What happened to the four wedding guests who were here? So huh? I want to know all about that, Casey, and my men are working on those angles right now. I also want to know more about Horseshoe Larkin's part in this thing. I put him and that valet under guard in one of the bedrooms. Come on. Captain Logan. Yes, yeah, Sergeant? We just found a wall safe in that library, and it's unlocked. Wall safe? There it is, sir. That picture was hanging in front of it. The door was open about a quarter of an inch. Well, what'd you find inside? Nothing, sir. Nothing? That picture hung over the safe. Logan, let's have a talk with Larkin. Okay. He's in here with the valet. So you're finally getting around to us, Captain. Around to you, Larkin. Waldo, go into the living room with this officer. Please, Captain, may I go to the kitchen? I, I haven't fed the Baron's poor dog yet. The old fellow's very weak. Okay, feed the pooch. Thank you, sir. Well, what do you want from me, Captain? The straight story of why you came here, Larkin. And tell the truth, because I'll check every word you say. Okay. De Pavel dropped 50 grand to me in a stud game. Here's his I.O.U.'s to prove it. I let him stall long enough. So I told him I wanted my dough right away. Or else. Or else meaning he'd be beaten up or bumped off. Why, Captain, how you talk. I simply told the guy he'd lose my friendship. Hmm. Go on. 
He called me up yesterday and asked would I accept a pearl necklace as a pledge until he could redeem it for cash. A pearl necklace? Yeah, he said it was worth 75 G's. I said it was a deal and I'd be here for it this morning. I came here and you know the rest. Did he tell you where he was getting that pearl necklace? I don't ask guys personal questions like that. And he said he had the necklace. Captain? Have you cops come across it? There's no pearl necklace here. Of course, you took a look in his wall safe. You know he had a wall safe? Sure, I saw him get dough out of it to pay other debts he owed me. You wanted to straighten that picture a while ago because you were interested in the safe behind it. Huh? That's right, Casey. But I guess the Pavel was lying to me about having him. And I lose 50 grand. I can't collect from him now. You've told a fairly smart story, Larkin. It makes you seem to have had an interest in keeping DePavel alive. And we'll check plenty on you just the same, Larkin. Sergeant? Yes, Captain? I want you to search this man thoroughly. Then give that ballot Waldo the same kind of going over. I want their home search, too. There's a possibility that a pearl necklace may have been taken from that safe. Go on, Miss Williams, Casey. Captain, just a minute. What is it, Sergeant? The boys have located both Sylvia Loomis and Mrs. Gardner. Where are they? The Loomis girl is in St. Anne's Hospital. She swallowed poison. Poison? Yeah. But the doc's got her in time to save her. Has she been able to talk? No, sir, and won't be able for a while. That's just swell. First Mason and now... Is Mrs. Gardner in the hospital, too? No, sir. She's been taken to headquarters. Now, at least I'll have a chance to question one suspect besides Larkin. Now, if you and Miss Williams want to hear what the lady has to say, Casey, come on. <laughs> Rene Dupavi was dead when I came into his apartment this morning. I swear he was. All right, now, just take it easy, Mrs. Gardner, and start from the beginning. You've been seen a lot with Pavel. You were infatuated with him, weren't you? Yes. Is that all? I... I've been keeping Rene supplied with money. Yeah. Several days ago, he told me he owed a gambling debt to a man who might... Might kill him if the debt wasn't paid. Did the debt amount to $50,000? Yes. I didn't have that much cash, but I had a valuable pearl necklace. I gave it to Rene yesterday. A pearl necklace worth $75,000, say? Yes. But last night I, I learned that Rene and Sylvia Lewis were going to be married. <laughs> I... You went to Dupavo's apartment to have a showdown with the uh, gentleman. Yes. You were pretty sore at him, huh? I had a right to be Mr. Casey. He made a fool out of me only a few hours before he'd made love to me. I'd given him my neck. You found him apparently alone in his apartment. You picked up that bronze statuette and you hit him over the head. No. No. He was dead when I got there. Huh? And who let you in his place? Yeah, tell me that, Mrs. Gardner. I had a key to his apartment. Here it is. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, what'd you do after you saw the Pavel's dead body? I rushed out of the place. These newspaper people saw me leave. Mrs. Gardner, did you recover your necklace before you left? Can you believe I'd even think of the necklace after I saw Rene lying in his own blood, Mr. Case? Uh, Lieutenant, you take over. If she changes her story in any vital detail, let me know. I'll talk to you later, Mrs. Gardner. Come on, Miss Williams, Casey. My guy should have rounded up the rest of the suspects by now. Here's your fish, folks. Thanks. Say, uh, you two sure look tired. Yeah, uh, yeah. Miss Williams and I feel all beat up, pal. Well, oh, I'll say we do. It's almost midnight, Ethelbert, and we started on this case at five this morning. Anything new on it? Mason finally talked. So did Sylvia Loomis. And the wedding guests told their story. What'd they say? Mm, well, it boils down to this, Ethelbert. Huh? By the time the wedding party <clears throat> reached to Pavel's place, it all sobered up a bit, and they were all tired. After the Pavel telephoned this guy, Waldo, to come in and whip up a breakfast, the guests all reneged on the whole idea and decided to go home, which they did. And according to Sylvia, she and de Pavel were only alone about ten minutes when Mason appeared. Yeah, lit to the eyes, too. 
Someone had tipped him off about the marriage, and he spilled the Pavel setup with Mrs. Gardner to Sylvia, the new bride. And when she learned that her new husband had been palsy wowsy with Mrs. Gardner only a few hours before the wedding, she blew up and tore up her marriage certificate and, well, this is her story, ran out of the place, went home, and swallowed poison. She left Mason alone with Duperville? Yeah. So she yeah. says. She also says Mason had passed out cold by that time. Sylvia may have done it while Mason was blacked out. Mason may have snapped out of his blackout after she left and done it. Or Mrs. Gardner may have done it. Gee, who done it? Well, you give us the answer, pal. How about Horseshoe Lark? No, his alibi stood up 100%. And the pearl necklace is completely disappeared. Oh, let's forget it, Annie. I'm going to fall asleep on my feet if I don't go home and hit the feathers. Come on, baby. Oh, I'm more than willing. Good night, Ethelbert. Here's the beers, pal. So long, kid. Good night. Hello, Casey. What? Lock. I've been waiting for you quite a while. You ought to have a better lock on your door. It was a cinch to slip it. What's the big idea? I want the pearl necklace. And you've got it. Nuts. Uh-uh. Hand it over, fella. And you won't have to worry about this gun in my mitt. I may even slip you a grand or two. I guess I'm dumb, Lock, and I don't get it. To save argument, I'll tell you how I got the goods on you. Yeah, that I'd like to hear. Well, you see, I happened to have phoned to Pavel between the time the Loomis chick left and the gardener dame blew in and out. And he answered the phone. He was alive. Yeah. Which means Mason killed him. But Mason didn't take the necklace. He was searched, I was searched, Waldo was searched. But you weren't searched, Casey. I see. I want those pearls, Casey. Gimme. You said something about... Uh... Slipping me a few grand, Lark. I meant it. I'm not a hog. Whatever they bring over 50, I'll split with you. It's a fair offer. Ah, uh, live and let live, I always say. When it's possible to let live. What? What? Get Make sure it's possible I'll take that gun, you dirty double-crosser. I came home to get some rest. Police headquarters. Give me Captain Logan if he's still around, will you? Just a minute. Why did I go into the newspaper business? Logan speaking. This is Casey. But what do you want? Whatever it is, the answer is no. I'm just leaving for home in some rent. Forget it, forget it. And meet me at DePavel's apartment as soon as you can get there. What for? To find those missing pearls and get a murderer. Huh? Yes, and incidentally, send a cop to my joint for a guy I envy. What are you talking about? Larkin is asleep on my living room floor, pal. Sleeping. <laughs> Sergeant Flanagan will answer. Oh, you're back, Waldo. Thank you for letting me in once more, Sergeant. How is the poor old dog? He was asleep last time I looked at him. May I see him? Sure. I'm greatly attached to him. He, he belonged to the Baron, but he was really my... Oh, Captain Logan and Mr. Casey. Hello, Waldo. Hi, fella. Just looking over your kitchen again. I, I've come to see the dog. I'm worried You've about him. You've been here before tonight? Yes, the poor old fellow is so weak... He, if he isn't looked after Look him. after him, Waldo. Thank you, sir. Oh, he's still and cold. I think he's dead. Really? Poor old fellow. The spaniel's dead, all right, Logan. Yeah, too bad. Gentlemen, perhaps I'm unduly sentimental, but may I take him with me and bury him decently? Why, certainly, Waldo. Thank you, Captain. After an autopsy is performed? Autopsy? It's a rule where a crime has been committed. I... I never heard of that rule. Oh, very well, gentlemen. I'll call for his body later. Good night. You're not leaving, Waldo. Not until you talk. Waldo, what's the meaning of this? Let me go. Talk, Waldo. Talk. I, I don't know what you mean. You came into this apartment by the service entrance as Sylvia Loomis was telling De Pavel off. You saw your chance and made your plan. You hit De Pavel with that statuette, thinking Mason would be blamed. You'd just gotten the necklace when Mrs. Gardner let herself in. You hid in that butler's pantry. When Miss Williams and I came in, you were stuck there, that right? The old dog offered you an out, you thought. You mixed the pearls in the ground meat prepared for that spaniel. You fed it to him right under our noses. 
After putting in some roach poison, you're head in his kitchen. And then you posed as a dog lover while waiting for him to die so he could walk out with his body and the pearls. Right, Waldo? Yes. It was just as you say. Take me to jail, gentlemen. I'm very tired. You're tired? Uh, are we tired? <laughs> Join the crowd of the Blue Note in just a moment. Of the many special features which make Fire King oven glass different, housewives most frequently talk about how easy Fire King is to clean. Yes, Fire King oven glass is amazingly easy to clean. And if you use old-fashioned cooking utensils, you're in for a pleasant surprise as soon as you change to Fire King oven glass. You see, Fire King oven glass has a special non-porous surface that's literally mirror smooth. This surface is the result of a carefully controlled scientific process exclusive with Fire King. And that's one more reason why it pays to insist on Fire King oven glass by name. There is only one real and genuine Fire King oven glass. You will find a wide variety of Fire King casseroles, pie plates, and general utility dishes in all sizes wherever household glass is sold, all at amazingly low prices. And you'll be charmed by the gleaming pale blue beauty of Fire King oven glass. A product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Well, so you finally got a good sleep, Casey, huh? Ah, <laughs> swell, Ethelbert. I feel like a million bucks today. Oh. If we could only spend the kind of money we sometimes feel like. Oh, no, you want to hoard that kind, Annie. Look at Artie Mason, Sylvia Loomis, Mrs. Gardner. Oh, well, fooey. Let's forget about the de Pavel case. Well, just to change the subject, Ethelbert, mm -hmm. what do you think of the new styles for women? Well, Miss Williams, as my sister Edna says, quote, it don't matter how women's fashions change, because their designs always remain the same. Uh, unquote. <laughs> you get it? Designs, Casey. <laughs> designs. <laughs> you better change the subject again, Addy. Definitely, Casey. Prime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass, Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Photographer is directed by John Dietz. The original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. Herman Chittison is the Blue Note pianist. This is Fire Prevention Week. Even now, during this program, fires are breaking out in the United States at the rate of one every 38 seconds, with fearful penalties and loss of life, painful injury, property destruction. Do your part by observing the simple but all important rules of fire prevention. Make every week a fire prevention week. This is Tony Marvin saying good night for the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, with offices in all principal cities of the United States and Canada. Thursday night on CBS is the biggest show in town, so stay tuned for exciting dramatizations on Reader's Digest Radio Edition, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS for Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>